problema. Tá. Então, eu vou... Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos ao quarto encontro de pesquisas do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Letras Estrangeiras e Tradução. Apareceu a sua imagem, professor James. We can see you. So you okay. can start your lecture, please. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning from uh, Fresno, California. I hope you're all well. Um, the it, present lecture for which uh, days uh, Professor Pereira has very kindly invited me is about a book uh, which uh, was published here two, two, two years ago or a year ago. During the pandemic, one loses a sense of time. And uh, if I have the uh, opportunity to visit you physically, I'll bring a copy or two uh, so you can read it yourself. I I don't have a PDF, unfortunately, but if anybody is interested in having a PDF of the book, uh, please let me know and I will try to get one. I understand that uh, such things are expensive, um, but I will introduce a, a poet, uh, Misak Medzarens, um, uh, who interested me principally because a friend of mine in Boston asked me to translate a, a poem of his for his wedding uh, in 1999. And uh, after doing that, I realized that this was actually not a very good poem and the poet must have written better poems than that so i looked and found that he was in fact an extraordinary poet uh i had already written or i was in the process of writing at that time a book on uh, bedro sturian uh who was the short-lived uh constantinople poet who in many ways invented the modern Western Armenian literary language single-handed as a young teenager. And it seemed to me that Misak Medzarens was his natural successor a generation later. And then the, I expected that there would have been a third, a third great poet, um, I, I'm not personally fond, very fond of Taniel Varujan or Siamanto, although I like some of their poems, but it seemed to me that the third great poet in all of Armenia was Yehishe Charents, the poet of the revolution in the young Soviet Union. Uh, and even he was cut short at the age of 40 by the Stalin repressions. So, um, in some ways, as is often the case with Armenian culture, there was a tremendous uh, innovative movement that began and that was then cut off before it came to fruition by forces beyond the Armenians' own control. Um, the third writer that I had planned to study uh, myself was Indra, Tiran Chirakyan, and his cycle of poems, um, Nochastan, the Cypress Grove, and his highly impressionistic novel with its many lexical neologisms, Nerashkar, uh, The Inner World. Uh, but uh, I myself, uh, retired from active duty, um, changed course in my own researches, and uh, this work will have to be left to somebody in the next generation to do. Um, the Abraham Terian, the professor of uh, Christian theology who lives here in retirement in Fresno also, has translated part of Nerashkar in a multi-volume history of Armenian literature, which you are no doubt familiar with, 
and he has set a very high standard uh, for a very difficult work, um, but a work worth doing. Let me then commence with the present lecture, if you will allow me. Misak Medzarents was born in the village of Pingyan, north of Malatya and Aachen, uh, Turkish Egin, in the farthest west of historical Armenia, where the Euphrates River bends wide and lazily west on its course south to Mesopotamia, in ancient times was the Hittite province of Melit or Melit Kumanu that the ancient Greeks came to know as Melitene, hence Malatya, Mahatya. It is the people they called Melitenioi who were perhaps the first speakers of Armenian. Moving over what was to be the country's ultimate Western boundary as they sought the rising of the sun. I believe Armenogenesis to consist of a linguistic migration of speakers of a language akin to Phrygian and Proto Greek from the West, merging ethnically with the Urartian population. So that so that the people we now know as Armenians are in a certain sense autochthonous in another sense related to the Proto-Greeks, the Mycenaeans and so on. Um, but the city now known as Malatya remained at the traditional boundary, the Western boundary between the Roman and the Parthian empires, then the Byzantine and Sasanian empires and their spheres of influence. Within its bend was the Armenian kingdom of Tsopk, or Greek Sophene, and the mountain fastnesses north of Harpert, Harput, and south of Yerzinga, Erzinjan, called Dersim. Uh, and these regions never submitted to any alien conqueror and indeed are in revolt against the Turkish government today. Uh, centuries later, and for long ages, till the baptized armies of Tiridates the Great, Tirtat, destroyed it sometime in the second decade of the fourth century. The temple of Aramazd, who is the father of the gods of the Armenian Zoroastrian pantheon, rose over the cliffs of the Western Euphrates. In, in Armenian, this is called the Aradzani River at Ani Kemach to the north and east. Somewhat eastward on Mount Sepu, in the uh, chain ringing the plain of Yerzinka, the Arsacid prince who had brought the faith was spending his last days in prayer. And Turdat, the legend says, appeared at the cave entrance and held out his magic sword called Havluni to St. Gregory the Illuminator, who raised his hand and the weapon of death turning downwards in the shape of the cross, the contrivance of life, entered the stone to await the future king. So this is a region which, whose legends and mythology and history go very, back, go very far back to Armenian origins, in fact. And uh, this, the legend of the sword and the stone, as you no doubt are aware, figures very prominently in the legends of King Arthur, in the cycle of King Arthur in Britain. And uh, my theory is that Armenian epic traveling northwestwards via the Nart epic cycle of the Caucasus um, took root pr principally in the region of Wales, in uh, the British Isles and the Arthur epic developed this particular motif from there. The Parthian dynasty that had ruled Armenia for nearly half a millennium fell in 429, but its blood flowed in the veins of the great Nacharar noblemen. Nacharars are feudal dynasts. Uh, they're, they're not exactly the same as feudal rulers, they are more like clan rulers 
who have a a an appanage a a a, a region which is ancestrally they hold um which is held in common with their entire family and then they create uh, or they created uh relations at will with other Nahararars who were then absorbed into the state system by gi being given hereditary positions like uh, masters of the king's wine cellar for Dagarabed for for example uh so the Nakharar system exemplifies in many ways what was Armenian politics. That is to say something which was intensely local and deeply um, family-based and conservative, and yet at the same time loosely connected into a dynastic or state system. Um, so the Nakharar system as it was changed with the changing circumstances of the conversion to Christianity becomes um merged with the uh with, with the with the uh, ecclesiastical system and the Nahararars become the Pahlavuni Catholicoi of the Armenian Church and a generation later the Nacharar Vartan Vartan Mamikonyan and the priest Revond, that represents a balance of power in a way, shed that uh, Parthian blood to preserve the new Christian faith against the Sasanian Persians onslaught and their attempt to re-evangelize Armenia as a Zoroastrian country. Late in the 8th century, the Mamikonians took their last stand against a newer enemy and conqueror, this time one that was here to stay, the Arab Caliphate with the new Muslim dispensation. In the century that followed, two surviving Nahar houses, Bagratunis and Artsrunis, succeeded in carving out kingdoms in the north and south of Armenia. This was through adroit diplomacy. In the early 11th century, this balancing act faltered. The successes of Byzantine campaigns against the Abbasids enabled the Emperor Basil to turn his attention to Armenia. And the Armenians' co-religionists, as has so often became the, been the case, became in some ways, politically at least, their worst enemies. Uh, in 1021, Senekerim Artsruni ceded Vaspurakan to the empire and moved with 14,000 retainers to the west of Armenia, to Sepastia. So here we see the beginnings of the population shifts, which will become relevant, in fact, to, to the world in which Misak Medzarens was born. Um, and in 1045, Byzantium annexed the great Bagratid city of Ani. The Armenians transferred the sacred relics of saints from the eastern part of the country to these new western settlements. The monastery of Narek, for example, on the southern shore of Lake Van, not very far from the city of Van, was refounded near Sepastia um, at uh, Divrik or Tefrike, which was to be the center of the Paulician heresy with which you're familiar. Saint Gregory of Narek, the mystical poet of the 10th century, had lived on the lake shore and later on in a mountain cave uh, high above it. I, I went there in the late 90s uh, and climbed the rock up to his cave. At that time, the PKK was involved in a ferocious war with the Turkish government. Um, we were more or less assured by our Kurdish guides that if, if we were captured by the PKK, nothing would happen to us, that we would actually have a very good time with them because we were interested in Armenia. Uh, so it was, it was not a dangerous trip in, in any case. But I did find a 10th century Khachkar, a cross stone, in the village of Narek. Uh, I found it in 1994. It had inscriptions on it. 
Uh, the villagers offered it to me as a gift, but it weighed several hundred kilograms, so I couldn't exactly pack it in my luggage, and I left it there. And two days after we had been there, the Turkish secret police, the meat, came and smashed the thing to pieces with hammers. Uh, they also defaced and destroyed parts of the church of Akhtamar on the island in Lake Van. So um, this is an area where the Armenian heritage has been actively destroyed since the genocide um, in a kind of retrograde, retrograde cultural campaign to erase the very memory of there ever having been Armenians there. It's a bit like is as though Nazi Germany had won the war and was able to erase the traces of the Holocaust. This is the this is the territory we're dealing with. Um, so as a boy, Misak Medzarens, our poet in the late 19th century, who was an avid reader of Narigatsi's prayers, his 95 prayers in his cycle of poems called the Madian Voch Bergutian, was to go on pilgrimage from his native village, Pingyan, to the, the Western Shrine, which by the 19th century had come to be called Aregavank, instead of Naregavank. They, it was shortened to Aregavank. But these shifts of Armenian population and power back towards the lands through which the the remotest bearers of their speech had come in immemorial antiquity, turned to flight after the Seljuk Turks shattered the forces of Romanos Dienis at Manaskert in 1071. Still, Armenians remained in numbers in their own land for another millennium. The city of Ani continued to prosper, even to expand, and a class of powerful merchants uh, developed called Medzadun, literally great houses, alongside the ancient nobility. So these were merchant princes, yes? But the highland was never to know freedom under Christian kings ever again. Legend has it that one of the retainers of Senekerim, a man named Benjamin, or Benik for short, fortified a place called Rabat, which is Arabic for city, the center of a town, on the banks of the Aradzani River in the far west. And this is the town in which uh, Mezarens will be born. A chronicler from nearby Anikamach, uh, remember the place where Aramaz's temple once stood, Grigor uh, Daranachtsi, came in the early years of the seventh, uh, 17th century to the place, which was by now called Bengan, and it's going to become Pingyan, after the long dead prince. And he writes, Apa yelyalandits genatsaki Bengan Ivankan, arak yev tadaretsak anten, voramrotser yev martikin padarazgmoch antem hapshtagoch an iravats. Leaving there, we went to Bengan, to the monastery. We stayed on in that place, which was a fortress, and the men fighters against lawless marauders. So the place was fortified and the people defended it. Grigor spent the year 1611 there and began to copy a Bible. So there was a monastery with a scriptorium, and he finished copying other books there also. We jump ahead 200 years. In July 1878, the Armenian ethnographer, in fact, the founder of Armenian ethnographer, uh, ethnography in many ways, Karakin Servanstians, uh, who was deputized by the Patriarch of Constantinople, visited the village, which was now called Penka or Pengyan. In Western Armenian, um, the original Benka becomes, as you can imagine, a, a P, so Pingyan. It was almost entirely Armenian in population with about a thousand inhabitants, three churches and a monastery, and five teachers in two schools serving 150 pupils, both boys and girls, 
who learned, among other subjects, English and French. So this is the kind of education that Misak would have received. Every home, he reported, had books on its shelves, and the village received newspapers and journals from Constantinople and also abroad. These were often smuggled because of the Ottoman censorship, and you have to realize that most of historical Armenia at that time had no roads or railroads or easy means of communication. They uh, Camel caravans still were the principal means of transport and trade between Mesopotamia, Iraq, and the Armenian highlands. So receiving these things from ports on the Black Sea, say, or from Constantinople, was a very considerable task. It wasn't like Amazon delivering a book. Yeah. Um, more importantly, though, the village retained and defended much of its ancient freedom. The spoken language was Armenian, not Armino-Turkish. Armino-Turkish was spoken, I would expect, by a majority of the Armenians who lived under Ottoman rule. Uh, there has been a great deal of nationalistic scholarship, which has tended, I think, to minimize the use of Armino-Turkish. Um, Armino-Turkish, as you know, is, is a, a, Tur a Turkish written with Armenian script. And the first books printed in the Armenian Empire were in fact in Armino-Turkish because Islam prohibited the, the use of Arabic uh, printing for quite a long time. Um, so where, where we find Armenian as the principal spoken language and the principal written one, this is an indication already of possibly political, a greater political independence than elsewhere. Uh, and, and I think in this case, it's definitely, definitely true. Um, Pingyan even minted its own coins for local trade that were marked in Armenian script. The men of the village were horsemen. They bore arms. Uh, every home had rifles and they struck terror into would-be marauders and rapists. <clears throat> it, was, it was not at all safe to travel on the roads in the Armenian highlands. The uh, Kurdish tribal formations routinely robbed travelers and also invaded Armenian villages to exact tribute under the pretext of being tax collectors for the Ottoman government. Um, and uh, Servantians reports that Armenian women were safe from mistreatment. Uh, on the landward side, the village nestled between the slopes of two mountains. They were called Khachmech and Sosik. The first means something like the cross within. The second, meaning little plane tree, refers to the shade tree, the giant trees, uh, plane trees, which were traditional in village squares. And our ancient Armenians used the sound of the leaves of these trees, the rustling of the trees, to um, for for divinatory purposes. Um, I once went to Musadakh, the place above the Mediterranean, where during the genocide, five Armenian villages banded together to defend themselves against the deportation order, and saw one of these plane trees it it was about a thousand years old and the trunk was actually hollow and big enough for several people to go, go inside and there were legends that heroes had hidden there uh there was a famous and most unusual bridge at pingyan that spanned the arasani river it could be raised in the time of troubles and was closed with iron gates every night. The villages, uh, villagers were farmers and they cultivated silkworms. One poem by Mezarens, Sherami Yeraza, What the Silkworm Dreams, was obviously inspired by this craft. The people of Pingyan successfully resisted the first wave 
of pogroms by the Ottoman uh, marauders during the massacres of 1894 to 96. But a second larger attack devastated the village and many survivors fled into the mountains or to large cities. We have an epic poem about this. Most had traveled to the capital at some point and had relatives with whom to stay. A lot of the men of Pinkyan were like Gastarbeiter. They would go to Istanbul, to Constantinople, to work and send remittances home, as, as is still the pattern uh, today. Uh, between Turkey and Europe. Um, but a number returned because Pingyan defied the order of deportation in 1915 and ended its thousand year life fighting in self-defense. Now there are no Armenians there. The principal clan of Pingyan was Misak's family, Medzadurian. Uh, and there are members of this family still living in France with whom I've been in contact. They lived in 66 houses, which were clustered around a stone Ivan, uh, a vaulted palace-like structure, uh, the architecture of which goes back to ancient Persia. When Cervantes visited there eight years before the poet's birth, one of them was the Mudir, the village headman. According to one tradition, the family were descended from the Meliks of Karabakh, or Artsakh, that is, descendants of the ancient Nakharars. There were five principal uh, Nakharar families in Karabakh, hence it was called the Khamsa, the group of five. Um, and these mountaineers had for centuries retained a measure of independence on the eastern edge of Armenia, and formed the nucleus of the uprising of David Beck in 1722, the time of the first real stirrings of the modern Le Armenian liberation movement. This is the same area, as you're all doubtless aware, where there has been a war between uh, the tiny Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan with its many international supporters and arms dealers and so on and so forth. And the situation now is extremely desperate. Um, according to Vahan Arslanyan, a, a relative of the poet, the Meza Durians had come from Ani. So Meza, Meza Dun families who had migrated to a place where they knew there would be freedom. This would probably have happened in the 13th or 14th century. If his supposition is true, then the family name may perhaps be understood as a deformation of the Metzadun word um, to Metzadun to Metzatush. Um, it's more, li more than likely that the early Metzadurians had made the long trek from one end of Armenia to the other, deliberately choosing a place where they knew they could retain some of their old freedoms. In January 1886, Iskuhi Medzadurian, her name before her marriage was Avakian, indicating that there was a priestly family there. Avak means elder. Um, bore a son Misak to her husband, Garabed Aga. The latter, like many villagers, moved to the capital to work, and Misak was to join him in Galata, a district of Constantinople, in September 1902. Now, there was a monastery dedicated to the Yeritzman Gantz, the three Hebrew youths cast into the fiery furnace in the Book of Daniel, in the village of Pingyan. And Misak bears the Armenian form of the name of the middle one of these three youths, uh, who was Meshech, uh, Setrak, Misak, Abednego are, are, are all three. They also have Hebrew names. But these names are Cappadocian and were thus uh, those of local holy men. And Misak in and Setrak were very, very common names amongst Western Armenians. Even when I was a young man, uh, it was common to meet people with these names. 
Um, he was the youngest child of the family with two brothers and a sister. Gevork had left the village to become a lawyer and journalist in Sivas, Sepastia, but Misak spent his first nine years in Pingyan, where he was a somewhat inattentive schoolboy who loved going out into the fields and woods. This is what uh, nascent poets should do, listening to shepherds' flutes when the herds were driven home. Sometimes he went out to the nighttime, nighttime irrigation of the fields, um, where it's very sunny and hot, as here where I live in the Central Valley of California, it's good to irrigate the fields at night. Otherwise, the, 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 the water simply dries up. Uh, in Brazil, you have rainforests, but uh, Armenia has a, a harsh continental climate. And in the hotter months, if you, if you irrigate uh, the land in the daytime, you, you will lose all your water. So it was at night that they did this. Um, and then he would ride back with a uh, a relative on the horse to the village. So he he often writes of nocturnal things too because of these pleasurable childhood memories. He would often go to the spring of Zag uh, to look for butterflies and on one of his lonely rambles he met a bear. Uh the villagers went on pilgrimage to monasteries to the mountainous con uh, country countryside and and Misak joined them there too. He loved the village uh, love songs and the lyrics, which were called sher from the Arabic word sha'r for poem and haren from hayeren or hayren, the so-called Armenian poem, a, a genre of short lyrics for which the late medieval bard Nahabed Kuchak is famous. And he listened with rapt attention to the recitation of Hekyats. Um, this is an Arabic word meaning a folk tale, a, a story simply, Hikayat, uh, um, which were told by his mother, Iskuhi, who was a devout woman. She would often go to pray at the shrines of the village on Saturday nights. Um, this is Giragmuk, uh, the, as in ancient Israel, Armenians often began the day with the sunset of the day before. So, so the Lord's Day, Giragi, the Lord's Day Sunday, began really Saturday night. And uh, this was a very ancient practice. And she would go and pray on Saturday night at a shrine, and he would go with her, and he wrote poems about this. Um, and so these echo through his poems, as do the words of the Sunrise Office and the Patarak, the Divine liter uh, Liturgy of the Armenian Church, as well as the Narek. And he, he wrote an essay, Naregatsi E. Head, about uh, Krikor Narekatsi. I've dwelt at some length on his early childhood and origins in order to dispel the possible impression that he was a country bumpkin who escaped what uh, Karl Marx rather unkindly called the idiocy of rural life to escape to a short but brilliant career in the big city, uh, short because he died of consumption at age 22. Rather to the contrary, his earliest and most powerful memories were of an almost magical place where armed and armed Armenians, unbowed by centuries of oppression, lived in relative freedom in the midst of a flourishing traditional culture, augmented by learning and enlightenment in a very progressive school system. Mezarens's language is extraordinarily rich. He had a very good education, and its classical elements are not stilted and bookish, but naturally flowing. So he actually engaged with the classical Armenian texts that he read. Uh, his evocations of village life and of nature are vital rather than precious or contrived. A great many Western Armenian writers never actually saw the land of Armenia itself. They simply had to imagine it. This includes 
geographers uh, living in Venice or Vienna who never set foot there and who simply had to describe everything from what they read and what they imagined. But he actually had been there. Uh, Turian, for instance, Bedros Turian, had never actually been to Armenia. He, when he talks about it, you can tell it, it, it smells very much of midnight oil. Yes, uh, he, he's been reading a great deal, but he, he never walked across a plowed field. Um, yes, so he, this all left him a kind of a deep and indestructible cheerfulness, which is very unusual in Armenian literature, which tends to be a bit lachrymose at times. And it emerges again and again in his work, the sun coming out from behind the clouds. In all of these respects, he differs very sharply from Bedros Turian, his predecessor. But it was all to end. The reign of the paranoid Sultan Abdul Hamid was oppressive enough. It was forbidden to print the words Hayastan, meaning Armenia, or Azk nation. But even words like Ast, star, were also prohibited in print because it was suspected that they might refer to the Yildiz palace, the star palace where the Sultan lived and thus encode plots of an assassination. Um, this was the kind of paranoid atmosphere of late Ottoman Turkey. And when Pingyan was first attacked in 1895, during the first great wave of massacres, uh, Misak and his mother had to live with his elder brother in the slightly larger town of Sivas, where they, they felt they could have greater sa safety. Um, this was not, in fact, to be. He studied at the Sahagyan School there and was sent in 1898 to Anatolia College, a boarding school run by American Protestant missionaries at Marsovan, uh, Merzifun nowadays. Misak, who was remembered as slender, melancholy, a little bashful, studied English and French there. He knew Verlaine, probably also Baudelaire, maybe Rimbaud. I kind of doubt whether he read Rimbaud. He may have read Poe and Blake in English. We don't know for sure. Um, and he loved Oscar Wilde's writing in particular and published an essay about him. Some Armenian writers had fled abroad to Paris or Cairo to escape the Hamidian reaction, but their writings in the journals they founded, such as Anahid, were smuggled in. So Misak read Arshak Chobanyan and Krikor Zorab, as well as the fin de siècle affair of decadence, like Yehia Demirji Bashian. He read and revered Turian's lyrics and even went to Iskudar, to Skutari, to visit the poet's grave and write a tribute inspired by Wilde's elegy of Percy Bysshe Shelley, the English romantic. In a later critical essay on the writings of Archbishop Yehisha Turian, Bedros's younger brother, who was born as Mihran, Mezarens observes that this is who Bedros might have become had he lived longer. Life in the large provincial towns was still dangerous for Armenians, and Misak's relatives worried openly about his rambles. In June 1901, he was on his way in Marsavan to visit a sick friend, Nerses Hoveyan, who was to die of consumption, tuberculosis, two years later, when a Turkish butcher's boy attacked and stabbed uh, Misak for no reason in the shoulder with a knife. Misak had sickened and been close to death during a drought when he was a year old. Though the stab wound healed, it seems to have permanently weakened his already challenged constitution. And he left Marsovan to join his father in Constantinople the following year, in September 1902, enrolling in the uh, Gentronagan Central Armenian School. He withdrew from his studies because he became seriously ill with tuberculosis in 1905. And he died on July 4th, 1908, 
which would have been in the old style 21st June. The attack brought forth Mezarens's first poem, Marbini Verk Sur Diverk, Wounds to the Body, Wounds to the Heart. And soon after his arrival in the capital, he was publishing poems in Armenian journals, such as Aravelyan Mamul, Eastern Press, using first the nom de plume Shavasp Ziadzan. Um, Ziadzan means rainbow, and this was also the title of his of the first of his two published volumes of poetry. Then he switched to Mezarens. He quickly shed the remnants of village dialect for the standard literary Western Armenian of Constantinople with its complex and, in my view, rather overblown prose syntax, uh, a lot of it modeled uh, on French and on uh, Ottoman Turkish. His poems, which were rather unfairly compared to the work of contemporary symbolists, uh, achieved instant, if not always favorable, notice. RPR, Arpiarian attacked him, among other young poets, in an article in Massis in 1902, uh, still more unfairly implying a kinship in his work with decadence. He wasn't de a decadent, and he, he really shouldn't simply be lumped into the gr group of symbolists. Uh, in, in Eastern Armenia, he was often compared to the local symbolist Vahanterian, um, okay, there are some similarities, but I think Mazarens' work is, is wider and larger. Um, in any case, he was neither hurt nor passive in his responses to these criticisms. Uh, he strode happily into the arena and published vigorous defenses of his own work and attacks on his critics. He was a gregarious person and had many friends in the capital. And so his satirical poems both make fun of his critics and nudge his friends. The symbolist creed is worth pointing out. They asserted that exotic colors, misted vistas, nocturnal reveries, half-heard murmurs are the delicate um indications and symbols uh, and symbolism of another world, truer and better than this. Though Mezarens' poems have some of these elements, he also celebrates reality and experience. Uh, in this regard, he's very remote from the decadence, for instance. I, I won't talk about them. Um, and instead, the compound words he uses seem to be seem to me to be strivings to evoke a vividly remembered scene or color or feeling in the world as it exists or as he would want it to exist. He was a lonely person. Um, we should perhaps remember. Sorry, is there, is everything okay? Yeah, I yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, we should perhaps remember that he was also, aside from being a literary figure, he was also an adolescent boy who was experiencing his first sexual awakenings. And unlike nowadays, that it was very hard to do that in Ottoman society. Uh, he remained a virgin to his dying day. He never had a girlfriend. He imagined girlfriends. He 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 conjures them up in his in his reveries. Uh, one in particular called Geizer Sparks. But for him, love was entirely a a sentiment that was never requited. He he did not know what. Um, what William Blake called the lineaments of gratified desire. Yeah. So when so when he uses his his creative language to express feelings and images in sensuous settings, 
this is in a way wishful thinking you know in a somewhat lonely reality um but he he retained a deep optimism and cheerfulness in the face of sickness and the certainty certainty of an early death uh his visitors were shocked by his appearance he tried to conceal his illness from his mother. When he spat blood, he washed it away so she wouldn't see it. Things like this. And like Turion, he worked feverishly towards the end of his life. His two volumes, Diadzan and Nortager, were published in 1907, and he continued to publish until a month before his death. Uh, all in all, he wrote about 100 poems roughly twice as many as Turian, but he lived two years longer. He was 22, Turian was 20. At the end of his life, his whole style seems to have changed. He died on the very brink of the Ottoman Revolution, which was to be, to be a false hope for Armenians in the most disastrous ways. But he became a very different poet, a political realist poet, and his very last poems, which we possess only in fragments, indicate that there was a new stage of development that was just coming and then was cut short. Um, I, When my book was published, they, for some reason, that final chapter wasn't there. So the publisher has published these fragments, which are crucial, as a separate page inserted into the book. And I'll just read you some of these very late poems. In the Plains, to suck the fresh milk of life at the sweet, spurting, sensuous breasts of the morn, in the public squares, the mob is roaring, bread, bread. He never uses words like public, square, or mob anywhere else. This is an urban setting. The sound is strident and different from anything. Or this one, the moon was the hanged man's eye. My fatherland's and then it breaks off. He never uses the word hyrenic, fatherland, anywhere else. Um, he never speaks about a hanged man anywhere else. The hanged man's eye, the when a person is hanged, their eyes bulged. Um, this was an image that Yechishet Charens, who couldn't possibly have seen these fragments, uses in his poem of 1920, Mahvan Desil, Vision of Death, which I think is his very best poem, which is about the horrors of the Armenian civil war before the establishment of uh, Soviet rule in the country. And so it's it, it seems to me absolutely clear, even from this one fragment, that at the end of his life, Misak Medzarens was developing in the same direction as at the other end of Armenia, the other end of Anatolia, uh, the Armenian revolutionary poets were doing in Tiflis, in Moscow, in Petersburg, and later on in Yerevan, when Yerevan became the center of Armenian life. Um, the year of Misak's death saw the revolutionary overthrow of the Ancien Regime and the installation of the Young Turks. The story's by now very familiar. Armenians participated enthusiastically in the new parliament, expressed nationalist aspirations. The um, Itahad Veteraki, the, the Union and Progress Committee, uh, especially after the Balkan War in which Turkey lost northern Greece, um, regarded the Armenians as a dangerous alien element. 
to be eliminated from the political and economic life of the empire. And we know of the Adana massacre, which was in many ways the Kristallnacht of the Armenian genocide. It was a dress rehearsal to prepare the population for a plunge into pure atrocity to see to gauge whether the population was ready to do this and as in the case of germany a generation later the population was more than ready to exterminate its own neighbors the people whom it had lived side by side with for a millennium and um this is the point at which everything was wiped out. The, Kur the Turkish government, uh, supported entirely by the Kurdish population, just as the Nazis were supported entirely by the Ukrainians and by many, if not most of the Poles, and by all of the Baltic states, all of these democracies we're told to love nowadays in the Holocaust, yeah, the, the Kurds who lived right there participated in the destruction of the Armenians and Pingyan ceased to exist. I can give you an example of how this happened because uh, there, are attempt, uh, there are Turkish attempts and attempts by Western journalists to uh, erase all of this history. I was in the village of Shushantz near Van one year with a man whose family came from there. They had been the parish priests. And a, a Kurdish villager welcomed us, gave us uh, bread and cheese, and pointed to what was left of the church, which was three small stones at the bottom of a pit. And he said that in 1953, he himself had helped destroy it. It stood until 1953. And he said, but the Armenians were giants. They were going to murder us if we didn't murder them. This is exactly what the Germans said about the Jews during the Holocaust. And yet, for some reason, that I cannot fathom the Armenian genocide, which was in many ways itself a dress rehearsal for the Holocaust, is understudied and barely recognized by the international community. And yet the more you study it, the more the affinities are perfectly clear from the propaganda to the ex post facto um, denial and, and, and so on. So in a way, Misak Medzarents is as much a victim of 1915 as all of his friends who were all killed in 1915. Because had he lived, there is no doubt whatsoever that he would have been deported along with the other 250 odd uh, Constantinople intellectuals, cultural and community leaders, and killed this uh, the same way they were. I would like to turn to his to some of his poems. Um, how much time have we got? Okay. 30, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. You can- 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yes. 20 minutes. Okay. I'm going to skip to a, a poem and offer an, a linguistic analysis. Um, with any luck, um, I can at some point come and visit you and then we won't have to worry about Zoom and we can just talk as long as we want. Uh, but uh, for, for today, uh, this will have to do. This is a, called Gyankin Yerke, the Song of Life. 
I'll read it. I'll read it in my English translation. Uh, from within life's frightful furrows, hissed whispers interspersed with cries to me, all hopes come but to great vanity. Emptiness seals life's inanity. Every flower by its fading is attended. Every life in black shadows ended. And as the incense of the bloom is routed, so vanishes all hope unsprouted. But through my smoldering reveries steals a light of sudden purple bright. The gold and iridescent lovely song of life to all of which I listened trembling. Let not these gloomy lamentations crush you, nor your golden hopes be scattered to the wind. Each furrowed brow is smoothed. A salve to every pain comes in self-forgetful smiles and laughter. Look now, the blue of heaven's canopy by bleary clouds is sometimes stained and smiles wink out. The rain pours down. But tears of rain predict their very end. Our word for rain contains the sun's name as its ending. And crying ends with sunlit smiles. And all the past occasions of our laughing create a long inheritance of happiness. Now, our word for rain contains the sun's name as its ending is the way I chose to translate this line. Amen ansrev, arev muni, irmen verch. Every rain has a sun after it, or a sun as its end. And this is an example of what Mezarens does with language. He takes the signifier, the word that describes a thing, and makes it more than the signified. Uh, I, in another lecture, I've uh, talked at some length about a word he uses in Geizer, uh, Ziranedzin, meaning porphyrogenitus, born purple, where he takes this word, which usually signifies nobility, and expands its meaning to cover a great many other things, which he can then embrace in the course of his poem. So the word becomes stronger than the thing it describes. And this, I think, is can be used, in fact, as a one definition of what the poetic the poetic act, in fact, is yes that a poetic act is taking a signifier and making it greater than the signified in this case he does it too ansrev means rain arev means sun arev is an ancient word in armenian it's uh, indo-european cognate to the sanskrit word ravi meaning sun is the name of the uh, the great sitar player Ravi Shankar, whom you're familiar with, and uh, so by taking apart Ansrev and making it into Arev, he's doing two things. First of all, he's he's making the word for rain something different from what it actually describes, and then he he notes that if you take the first part of the word ants, even though it's written with a tsa instead of a tso, in Western Armenian, it can mean to pass. Yes? So as the rain passes, uh, ants, you get arev at the end. And then if you look at the first letter of the word for rain, uh, a, and then connect it to Rev, you have exactly that. Our word for rain contains the sun's name at its ending. Now, this is an extremely intricate process, yes? And it suggests to me that Medzarens 
was not just a, a lyric poet of unusual talents, but an extraordinary reader of his own language. The uh, Many of his poems refer to incidents in classical Armenian literature, particularly very vivid episodes as in that you encounter in Movses Khorinatsi and Pavstos Buzand, um, where he has taken key words, like for example, the word for for a dappled horse, a horse whose whose uh, skin has spots of color, not all one color. Yes, and he's done things with those words that has ha, hasn't been done by Pavstos. Um, when I was, uh, I'm I'm 69 years old. Uh, 50 years ago, I was reading classical Armenian for the first time with my teacher, Krikor Maksudian at Columbia, and we were reading Pavstos Buzant, and like any uh, person of that age, uh, adolescent, I was, of course, immediately attracted to um, Pavstos's very vivid descriptions of all sorts of sexual adventures of uh, of of the sinful kings of Armenia who were constantly being chided, yeah, by the the patriarchs. And my teacher Nina Garsoyan uh, inspired this study further, and she she uh, wrote the exemplary work on Pavstos Buzant, the Buzantaran. Anyway. Um, so I imagine Misak Medzarens being similarly attracted to Pavstos, linguistically, thematically, viscerally, sensually, and reading this stuff. Yeah, um, more of that in another time. Um, I think I have time for one more poem. Yeah, and then maybe we can have some discussion and then finish for the day. Um, I want to read you a poem, which I think is his Ars Poetica. It's his statement of everything. It's, it's, it's a pantheistic poem, um, which he dedicated to Keram Parsekian, his friend, uh, called In Charpet Sutyamp, with what intoxication? Now, it's your choice. Should I read it in Armenian first and then English, or do you want just the English? Yes, Armenian also? Okay. In Sharpet Sutyamp. In Sharpet Sutyamp, Zaurer Luisin Mech, Zaurer Hovin Mech, Yev Anzrev Nerun Varsavor Zaurer, Zaurer Yerk Nuchesh, Ud Zaurer Matach. Zovadzup kananch, Zoreni tsamkin, Kokninkads, Shivarun, Amen al Gyankin, Gempen, Hort Chachanch. In Sharpetsutiamp, Chotnvor, Horenver, Gele, Azmailun, Gapana, Luisin, Varkian, Ma Aproch, Ir Zore Achker. In Sharpetsutiamp, Zahik ner shahin, Zahik ner luisin, Materim tserkin, Aspasum nerun mech genavahin. In charpet sutiamp, Amen mek arot, Amen mek blurak, Ir kananch chaktin, Kakabe yerpnats, Zahike narot. In charpet sutiamp, Tashteren horot, Yevhar soviten, Garmrot ani, garne aragil nir darzin karot. In charpet sutiam sariak neren artun, Luisa gzzen, Luisa ghzzen, Murgastan neru mejen sahartun. In charpet sutiam, zion jayesh, zapin, parts ren. Oda gem Luh Gukan Arpin Vosketsotzin Ugetevanan In Sharpet Sutiam Tatraken Harseni Aragastarad Zari Hovanin 
գսպասետար պոտ իր վարուժանին, ինչ արպեցությամբ թիթերն է պացեր, լելակի մանրիկ լիչին վրա պրպրուն, առակաստա շեն իր գատ թեվիքներ, ինչ արպեցությամբ զիրանի տաշտին շեկ ծախիք ներունմը վաղ է մեղուն, վազ է մեղուն, ձձել իկայի պտխունքներն հեշտին, ինչ արպեցությամբ ձովերն են կապույթ, գետերն հորտաչուր, աղպյուրներ զեղուն, լիչեր խաժակույն, առուն շուտապույթ, լորը ձամ առուն, որ կանցնի կովեն, ուր է ստաներում գեջ լսնակապույթ, ինչ արպեցության պամպեր կտր, թոտվեն հրաշալի հեղուկն իրենց աստինքին, որ զերտ աստխանի վար գսողսկի, մարելու երկրին պասու կվոսկի, ինչ արպեցությամբ զայն գուշտ կխմեն համագրավ տաբեն սատած հողին ծնունդներ ամեն ծախիկ, ծակտիկներն ամեն, ինչ արպեցությամ հոգին գնդկրգե ալիագն հորդահոս ձայրի իպորին, ձրատրին անանուղ վայրի ռեհանի բազմաբուրումներն ստաշխ ու խունք է, ինչ արպեցությամ գնդկրգե անի բոլոր ձևերն ու երանգներն ամեն, բոլոր գոյությանց, բոլոր տարժերուն իր մեջ անդրատարձ ձիածանում են աստվածն, որ եկա չես կիտեր ուրկ է։ Now, there are a million things you could say about this poem. In a way, its lexicon alone covers every aspect of uh, of Mezzarense's poetic and philosoph phil philosophical conceptions. But here, here's a translation, and I think with that we can conclude and just uh, have a few minutes for discussion. How drunken the trees in the light, trees in the wind and in the rain, shaggy tress trees, trees that to heaven strain, and saplings green and tossing, crests like sea waves, tumbling to the bosom of the wheat fields in a daze. All life is drunken on the sun's abundant blaze. In what intoxication the grass above the dark soil rises, opens to the light amazed in the instant of its life, the dew drops of its eyes. How drunken are the flowers in the dew. Flowers in the light, at ease beneath the hand's caress, are swooning now in expectation. With what intoxication every hillock on its green brow binds the blossoms, multicolored nuptial diadem. And from the lovely plain and dale, the red-foot stork now guides his bride, returning home imbibes his longing satiation. With what intoxication? Blackbirds drink the light and whisper it alert in orchards' leafy fastnesses. With what intoxication the snow-white jays afloat on high, sail perambulate upon the sky, taking wing, their bodies gilded on the glowing firmament. With what intoxication the turtle dove her nuptial bed arranges in the shady bower of a tree for her swain, in patient passion, the drunken butterfly unfolds upon the tiny sparkling lakelet of its leaf, and with its milky winds erects its canopy, with that intoxication above the purple plain, to scarlet flowers, highs the bee, to suck upon the tiny female nipples luxuriant. In their drunkenness, the seas brim blue. The river waters surge, the streams are spilling, the rivulets purl swiftly, lakes azure, the brook, his waves green fronded tossing, slips beneath the willows pale and lunar limbs, 
The drunken clouds now shake their shaggy heads, the wondrous liquid massing in their breasts. And like a snaking thread, the rain descends to slake the hot gold thirst of earth. With that intoxication, drink their fill upon the parched soil's universal burn. All creatures born, all flowers grown. Drunk, the wave laps and embrace the perfume tree. Thyme and milk and basil growing wild and storax frankincense. Aromas teeming are embracing drunken. Everything, all shapes and forms, all colors gleaming, all essences and elements. He whose rainbow everything reflects returning. God, who from God knows where, has come to them. Thanks. Okay. Do we have a few minutes for discussion? Okay. Yes. We'd like to thank you, Professor James, for a beautiful recitation of Mezzarin's poems in English and Armenian and your brilliant speech. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to listen to you. And now it's the questions. Vocês têm perguntas, gente, para o professor James, por favor? Thanks. Vocês podem pôr no chat também? Tem sim, tem sim. <laughs> yes, they have. Oh, okay. Podem pôr no chat, se não quiserem falar, o pessoal que está aí. I have so many questions to you. You can stay all the, all the afternoon here. <laughs> okay. Um, here's one thing we can do if we don't have time. If anybody wants to write me questions, uh, you can give them my email address and I'll answer in writing. I know a little Spanish and no Portuguese. Um, so if you could write to me in English, it would help. Um, if you write in Spanish, I'll try to answer. Um, the only Spanish I know really is from my mother, who's a native speaker of Ladino, which is Judeo-Spanish. So it's, it's somewhat different probably from what's spoken in South America. But anyway, um, we could try one question now, I guess. Uh -huh. I'm, okay. I'm writing your email here so they can write you if they want. Okay. Let's see. I have one question to you, please. Yes, Professor please. James. Why do you use, use transliteration in your books instead of the transcription in the Armenian alphabet of the poems? Why, oh, you in why do, is there no are facing text in Armenian? Yes, you yeah. use transliterations. Oh, transliterations. Yes. Um, well, there is discussion of particular lexical items. Um, and there, they're trans, they're the Armenian phrases and words are transliterated in Western Armenian pronunciation, or when it is a class, it, their classical Armenian in the Hübschmann Meye system. Um, for reasons simply of finance, finances, we reprinted the entire te text of the uh, critical edition at the back of the book, um, which is in the Soviet orthography which uh, I, I don't think poses a problem to people who already speak Armenian anyway. Um, and there is an Antilius edition of Siamato in the older orthography, uh, which is easily accessible even now. Um, I guess the reason, the, the, the reason that we didn't give the entire 
transliteration of every poem next to the English translation was that it would have made the book into several volumes. It would have simply mm. been too long to print as a single volume. And I thought it ought to be one volume uh, so that it could be more easily used by students in particular. Uh, I have no idea whether in fact the book is being used because it came out during the pandemic. So th this has changed and disrupted everything, yeah. The students that complain it because the book doesn't contain uh, the poems written in Armenian alphabet. That's why I ask it. Oh, yeah, well, they can flip to the end and uh, just read the poem there because each poem is keyed to its page number in the critical edition. So all they have to do is just look at the end of the book where the where the entire critical edition is reproduced. And they can also see variants, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can read the chat, but everybody's uh, saying congratulations to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Uh, it was yeah, a gorgeous I speech. I... <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm... Uh... Um, oh, it's when it started, it's because it says afternoon there. Yeah. Um, thanks. And email to Professor James. Rose. Yeah, please just call me James. Uh, you don't have to use professor or stuff like that. Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to address any questions. Do we have time for perhaps another question? Yes, I have so many questions. I don't know if you have time. Well, yeah, um, I, I have time. Yes. How do you know the authors who influenced Misak Mitzarens? How do you find it out? How do we find it out? Uh, well, partly through knowing what he read, knowing what he read in school and what was available at the time. Um, there were certain poets, uh, Armenian poets, whom he mentions and whom he knew and obviously whom he read. The, in the case of classical Armenian texts, the giveaway is very often the use of obscure words that are only found there or of themes that you can tell he got uh, from the Narek or from Pavstos or from Movses Horinatsi. It's, it, it's not very difficult detective work to do. In the case of the French poets, I don't think that their influence is significant, but uh, I think there's plenty of room to disagree with me there and to write a good book about Misak Mezarens and French literature. Um, where it comes to English, that's, that's, that's hard. I can't prove that he knew English literature. Uh, from the poem in Sharpet Sutyamp and the way I translated it, you can probably tell that both of us, both he and I, were channeling Edgar Allan Poe. And I know that Edgar Allan Poe was definitely read uh, in Armenia. And I know that he was appreciated. He was appreciated because he was appreciated in France. Baudelaire was the person who made Poe respectable. He was never respectable in his own country. He died drunken in the street in Baltimore and was forgotten and unknown in America until the Americans found out that the French liked him. So, oh, he must be respectable and interesting and worth reading. It was the same thing with Melville, the same with many writers in this country. America is a country that produces great poets and then treats them very cruelly. Yeah. But in in um 
in Europe, uh, Poe was read, and then he was translated into Russian. So the Russian symbolists also read him. Uh, Balmont translated him, Konstantin Dmitrievich Balmont into Russian, and then Rachmaninov wrote music based upon his poem, The Bells, and I see in Sharkatsutyamp as a kind of an echo of the bells. So, uh, and also I, I have a very, very long article on bells, Zanga Knesh, in Armenian poetry, uh, which it, dealing with some other Western Armenian poets who were murdered in the genocide, yeah. So um, that's this whole separate discussion. In the case of English literature, it's always a little harder. Um, we know that he liked Oscar Wilde because he mentions it. Um, the English romantics, Shelley, uh, Tennyson, Keats, they, they, they were read in Armenia. So, and we know that, uh, that Medzarens was literate. He would hang around the editorial offices of Armenian literary magazines and drink coffee with people in the afternoon. Um, literary life in Constantinople was not a case of people sitting in cubicles in front of computers and constantly being busy. Yeah, they, they, it was more like what it was in uh, Soviet Armenia when I lived there. Um, I can give you an example. Um, I I would work at the Maten Adaran. I would arrive at the, the in, Manuscript Institute. I'd go there at about 10 or 11 in the morning uh, with my friend Arts Runi Sahakyan, and we would drink coffee on the way and sit in a cafe, and then uh, we would go and do a lot of work. And then at early afternoon, we would go go to a cafe called Michansnahovik, which means the, the breeze that goes through, the, in Russian, Skvesnichok. And about 15 of us would spend the rest of the afternoon there talking about what we were doing or what interested us. This included Levon Der Petrosian, who was the Syriac scholar who was to become the first president of post-Soviet Armenia. And this was our real work during the day. This was the point at which we found out about books we hadn't read, um, got to talk about the work we were doing. Then we would go back to the Maten Adaran and work until about seven in the evening and then go home. Uh, Constantinople was something like that. That was the pattern of the life that that Medzarens led. Even when he was very ill, his, his friends would come to visit him at his parents' house. And if he was well enough, he would go for a walk with them. And then so they talked about literature. Yeah. I don't know. Of, obviously, I'm in one corner of the world and you're in another right now. And I don't know what literary life is like in Brazil. I haven't even a, a vague idea of it, but sort of halfway in between, if you like, imagine place Mezarens in the in the place of Roberto Bolaño's hero in The Savage Detective, his early novel, which takes place in uh, CDMX in, in Mexico City. And so imagine the, the, the cafes on the Paseo de la Reforma, you know, where people are just sitting around talking a lot and uh, looking at books and, 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 and not being very systematic. I mean, this is how he would have read. This is how he learned things. And then he would write. He wrote mostly at night. He, he would go into his room his imagination would take flight and he would write things. Um, some of the poems I was going to read are about his mother's prayers um, and about supernatural beings, spirits in the water mill in Pingyan, um, about, about the 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 noontime the heat and 
the sounds in the trees, the sounds from the mountains, the plowing, all these things. And then there were highly abstract poems as well. So all of this, the, he, he worked in isolation when he wrote from the laboratory of his imagination, but his days were spent in a very social world. Yeah. Okay, Professor James, uh, I think time's up, but uh, nós recebemos aqui hoje, né, Professor James, Professor Emérito da Cadeira de Estudos Armênios da Universidade de Harvard. We'd like to thank you a lot for kindly sharing your knowledge with us. It was a great pleasure. I think I can I'll speak in the name of all who are present today. So thank you a lot, Professor James. Thank you too, and see you tomorrow. God see willing. you tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Bye, <laughs> God bye. bless you. All. God bye. bless. Bye bye. Bye.